Hi, welcome to Online Travel Talks. I'm Julia Fuel and I'm the MD of OTT. And today I'm very pleased to welcome Kurt Janssen from the Tourism Alliance. Welcome, Kurt. Pleasure to be here. Brilliant. So, Kurt, um, I remember when we last spoke to you, you actually live in the Barbican, which is pretty much the city of London. Well, I think it's even classified. It is the city of London, isn't it? It is indeed, Barbican. yes. Absolutely. So you're very lucky to sort of work right in the centre of everything. And last time a Chinook fellow uh, f- fell over, <laughs> flew, up, <laughs> flew over, well, can't get my words out today. Um, but today you were telling me that actually you've now got finches. All kinds yes, of finches, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we've um, got a noisy flock of finches out uh, the window today. Uh, We live in a a little bit of a wildlife haven in in the city because no one around here owns cats and therefore um, the the small birds can kind of play and do what they want. So it's quite a nice environment. Yeah, lovely. I know because up until you you mentioned about cats, I'd never really thought about as I walk around London, I never do see a cat. So, but you don't think, oh, I haven't seen a cat. You just walk about London, don't you? (laughs) And then, so now I get it. So it's great to know the birds are multiplying and doing well in Barbican. Anyway, we're not here to talk all about the wildlife, but I thought it was just interesting. <laughs> um, we're here to talk about how the recovery is going. And uh, obviously your um, association is really important um, because it's, it represents the groups of associations, doesn't it? Maybe just talk a little bit about your association anyway. Yeah, sure. your, your, yeah. the- the, the Tourism Alliance is an umbrella trade association for the tourism sector. So mm-hmm. we pull together about 65 different uh, trade associations and membership bodies, uh, whether they be inbound, outbound, domestic, accommodation, attraction, transport, uh, pulling in everyone who's got an interest in tourism together to provide a united kind of voice to government on uh, policy issues. So we advocate kind of saying the tourism industry as a whole thinks this about your policies uh, so that they get kind of a coherent messaging from the industry about uh, what they should be doing to support businesses. Absolutely. And so from there, you then take your representations to government and and see (laughs) <laughs> if they listen or <laughs> what kind of influence you can have on behalf of the industry so it's really important work that you do and have been doing throughout the recovery so so tell us how how are things going we're, we're in a recovery year so um yeah are we positive and negative yeah th- things so, so. are kind of picking up so so we're in recovery um if we take the beginning of the year we did a survey of uh businesses and found that uh just over 25 percent of tourism businesses which are the 300,000 businesses in the tourism sector so a quarter of those had no reserves whatsoever they were absolutely running on on fumes Mm -hmm. and another 42 percent i think it was um had less than three months of reserves so you know a lot of businesses throughout the sector were in an incredibly poor way Mm -hmm. and the work that kind of we did working with numbers from visit britain uh suggested that over the two years of covid uh that businesses in the sector had lost a staggering £179 billion in revenue, which is an astronomical number. So we were very Mm. concerned about the the state of the industry, how many businesses would survive. And while there has been casualties in the sector, uh, it's kind of nothing like kind of what we might have expected if that £179 billion had kind of worked its way through into to actual kind of jobs on the on the ground yeah. so there has been a real kind of resilience in businesses which has been great mm. and so this year has been one of businesses trying to rebuild their balance sheets um yeah. you know from that dire situation and while it hasn't been you know a great year it, it hasn't been a disastrous year either you know, we were hoping for better um but we'll kind of take it um as it is at the moment great so a kind of steady as she goes report in a way and yeah, um, kind of near disaster but just diverted like a film you know yeah. <laughs> three months yeah. to go of cash and then you know there are, there are sectors, over. Yeah. yeah there are sectors that are kind of still kind of suffering real pain um sure. you, 
businesses in the English language schools, for example, because there's been a huge drop off um, yeah. in school groups being able to come over from uh, Europe. And the work we've done with them suggests that uh, revenue this year for English language schools and, and school trips and the like is still down kind of 84%, which is, you know, a real, that's big. real yeah, yeah. That, that's really big. Yeah. Uh, but other sectors kind of uh, are coming back. Uh, inbound is is still kind of struggling. There's been some good bits. Inbound from the states is really going well at the moment. Okay. But you know the latest uh, predictions from Visit Britain is we're still going to be down kind of a third on pre-COVID levels. Uh, on inbound tourism by the end of the year. So it's kind of nowhere near job done and we still need to kind of have policies in place to, to support kind of business growth. Sure. And do you think we can handle an increase anyway? Because if you're saying there's been a lot of companies in difficulty, I'm not sure how many jobs were lost or companies didn't make it. Um, so even if we did increase visitor numbers coming into the UK, um, I mean, what capacity can we handle? Can we handle 20% more, 50% more? Yeah, the, the capacity is there. It's, it's one of the, the is, great yeah. things of the tourism industry is that mm. kind of, we do have spare capacity in the, in the sector. Yeah. Um, so if we had 20%, 30% more overseas visitors, um, mm. you know, we've certainly got the bed spaces to fit them. We've still got the attractions which can handle that capacity. The, there's no problems. And it's... It's one of the things we're advocating to, to government at the moment is that if you want growth in the economy, other businesses, you've got to invest in capital um, mm. and structures that, you know, to, to get it. And there's a lag between the investment and when that business kind of comes on stream and increases growth. In yeah. tourism, if you do a marketing campaign overseas, you can kind of increase growth within three, six months time. So it's mm. got a, a really fast turnaround uh, period from your investment to mm. the rewards that you receive from it. Yeah, absolutely. We work with Visit Britain actually in Australia in promoting, um, a, uh, you know, Visit Britain really from, in, from you know, Australasia uh, as, a, as a continent. So, um, so that's, yeah, that's interesting um, to hear. Is it just inbound that you're focused on or do you also measure outbound and trends there? Yeah, looking, looking at outbound, um, outbound's you know, going better than, than inbound at the, at the moment for, for a number of reasons. You know, people kind of, uh, after two years of lockdown, wanting to get away and kind of go overseas on holiday. Mm. But what's really interesting in the outbound is the number of people who are getting away for visiting friends and relatives because, you know, oh. you've been kind of cut off from, from friends and relatives for two years. The first yeah. thing you want to do is, you know, go see your family, go yeah. see your, your friend, friends overseas. So there's quite a bit of uh, the recovery, which is based on people reconnecting after mm. the pandemic. We've also got the, um, a slight interesting issue there too, as well, in that uh, there's a lot of people over the last couple of years who've booked overseas trips, haven't been able to go on them, have received vouchers from their travel yeah. company. And of course, these uh, vouchers have expiry dates on them. So mm. people are trying desperately to you know, get an overseas trip and to use up these vouchers before they expire. And yes. a lot of them expire at the end of this year. Yes, and that sort of made the industry very, very busy, but not necessarily help their balance sheet to sort of coin your phrase what they're trying to build because it's money already yeah spent yeah. essentially isn't it yeah and, and businesses um you know have real problems too you know the, the inflationary you know cost of living crisis isn't restricted to just the customers you know mm. the businesses are going through exactly the same thing mm. um plus they don't have caps on on their energy costs uh which you know consumers do mm. uh also you know there is a large number of people who have left the industry. So there's huge numbers of vacancies uh, throughout the, yes. the sector. You know, some of this is Brexit related with kind of uh, EU nationals going back home. A lot of it, uh, when tourism businesses were closed down, people shifted into other sectors of the economy and have jobs there now and are not 
coming back into the sector. Mm. And of course, you know, we've got um, a lot of people kind of reassessing what they're doing kind of with in life and what's important to them, reprioritizing and deciding to take early retirement, for, for example. So all yeah. these factors have you know, come together to say that actually we don't have enough people working in the sector. So businesses are fighting over employees, having yeah. to pay, you know, uh, over the oh. odds to just to get staff yeah. to, to remain open. And yeah. so you got a kind of a, a wage spiral going on as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I heard that it was about 20% of the world's global tour, travel and tourism workforce has been displaced either, as you say, resignation, redundancy or you know change of life retirement all those those factors and that amounts to millions um, yeah, it, but we are seeing three times more people um buying gds courses introduction to travel and various sort of cool ir courses that we that we have on ott so that's a whole new wave of brand new people coming through so i think also companies are hiring brand new talent which will be quite interesting for the industry it's a fresh perspective you know, new way of looking at things, perhaps. Yeah, exactly. You know, mm -hmm. out of, out of adversity, kind of um, springs invention, and you know, yeah. um, you know, with the uh, increased wages, the businesses are having to pay people. You know, while it's a, a real kind of negative force on on the business itself, mm -hmm. in terms of the industry as a whole, kind of higher wages encourages more people to to come into the industry, and so we'll get kind of, you know good people, bright people coming into the sector, which will uh, really help drive productivity in the future. Um, yes. It's a problem we've got to get through at the moment, you know, which is kind of causing pain um, in the you know, immediate future. But the long term, you know, getting new bright people in is, is absolutely um, perfect. Yeah, absolutely. And the other interesting trend, um, we OTT also did a, a survey and we found that 67% of um, the people that were surveyed were either working fully from home or hybrid, working from the office and from home, whereas in 2019, it was only 30% worked from home and 70% were in an office. So, I mean, what, what are your sort of um, views? Because as then you mentioned, there's pressure on energy bills for companies and, you know, keeping offices going is also an expense, you know, rates, rent. Um, do, how, do you see that continuing or do you see a, con a continuous shift more to further remote working? It, it's a bit of a, a double-edged sword in that it, mm. you know, remote working is, is a good way of uh, reducing a business's costs. Mm. Um, the problem, obviously, kind of with, with tourism and hospitality is that um, it's very hard to cook someone a meal remotely or, or <laughs> well, serve obviously. them in a restaurant or pull a pint yeah. of beer yeah, um, yeah. from home. So, mm -hmm. you know, and in terms of the tourism <laughs> industry, because it is such a, a service industry, mm. you need people to be kind of on premises. Yeah. And there's yeah. kind of a limited number of people who can kind of work from home. Yeah. Maybe the mm. travel agents and tour operators can, can do more of that. But there's a, mm. a core of people who can't really kind of work from home. The, the other side of that, of course, is that it's just not, uh, it's not just the tourism industry where people are working from home, it's completely across the board. So you've got a real problem uh, in city areas, mm. you know, including London, the city of London, where a lot of the kind of finance insurance people are still working at home. And these are the people who, drive you know the pubs the restaurants the going out to shows after work you know the those components of the tourism industry are reliant on workers coming into work mm. so uh you know the longer that people uh stay working from home or even hybrid working kind of um the longer it's going to take for kind of businesses that rely on on workers for their kind of core income yes. will be able you know, to take to recover and we can see you know casualties you know occurring in um you know some businesses that that rely on on uh on workers coming in mm. yes it's sort of an experimental time all this sort of remote working office and hybrid working yeah. and and how that will shake out we'll we'll see it could be the local areas strengthen with more 
facilities uh, restaurants are doing very well sort of locally <laughs> yeah I maybe mean, the, the, one more of the so other than before maybe i don't know yeah i mean one of the other interest, um, interesting issues that kind of comes from remote working um is that you know at the moment we've got a lot of um concern being expressed by local communities and uh councils and, and mps about uh accommodation availability in rural and seaside areas now some of that is due to people remote working and kind of being able to kind of work at the seaside um, and of course the government is is encouraging and i say that in you know quote marks this remote working by kind of increasing kind of broadband availability to rural and seaside areas so the, the more they connect them in yeah. terms of uh, broadband the easier it is for people to work at home therefore kind of, if you can why wouldn't you kind of um, shift to Be the done. seaside and work from from there and that causes kind of real concern about kind of second homeowners um, and kind of conflating people uh, buying a second home and kind of working there with self-catering cottages so you, there's a lot of calls for kind of restrictions um, on people having second homes or self-catering units at seaside locations which could impact kind of tourism to these areas in future wow it's complicated isn't it it's not it isn't easy. I don't know why anyone wants to be prime minister right now. I really don't. It's like the hardest job. It's got to be. Everyone. I mean, you kind of want to go just back to how we were, but things have changed so much. You just can't. So we have to yeah. then feel what this new, I hate to say the new normal. Um, we haven't quite got to the normal yet. I don't think it might take a few years. It might take a decade. This whole decade might be completely transformative. By the end of it, we'll all look back, look at all the trends and go, wow, what a decade. Now look at where we are. And actually, I think I think that's actually what, what we're going to have to do. Roll with it and see what lands because technology yeah, is running at such a speed as well. I, th I think you're absolutely right. I think um, there has been a kind of step change in kind of how we work and, and where we work. I think that kind of the, the high watermark may have been reached in terms of kind of people working from home and that we'll gradually see people coming back to, to city centres. And that the reason I, I think this is that there is a lot of work yeah, in offices that's done around the water cooler, you know, for dropping it at someone else's desk mm. with going out with colleagues after work. Yeah. If you're removed from that and all your colleagues are, you know, talking together, getting together in the office, mm. then you're kind of being overlooked. And there'll be a point where you think, actually, if I want to kind of develop my career and you know, I've got to get back into the office and interact with my colleagues, I can't just stay at home or else I'll just be overlooked for promotions or you know, um, uh, kind of placements or anything like that. So I think there will be a gradual kind of um, pull back to the office because people will realise that it's in the best, uh, it's best for their careers to be around other people and engaging with them. Yeah, and that might be one of the reasons companies will mull on for keeping an office as well, because you've now got to justify why do you keep an office and pay all this money? <laughs> so you need to sort of think about the value that you get from that and by colleagues working together in a more collaborative team-like way and getting more output from that, that would be one of the factors, wouldn't it? I worry about the young people, actually, because oh, yeah. there's a certain sort of age group that where it suits very well home working but for younger people whether it's some people might not easily be able to work from home um, well actually at any age it's not always possible depending on your situation so there's that dynamic but also new people especially if they're young need mentoring coaching learning on the job and uh, I think that's probably going to be a bit tricky remotely so yeah uh, I think we've got to work it all out at the moment we're in experimentation and this has turned into more about a remote working discussion <laughs> but <laughs> It is quite fascinating, I must say. Um, yeah, because we don't know what we're doing. If it's right, it's wrong. We just have to, you know, manage as best we can. And there'll be books written in the future on the best way to, you know, manage a remote workforce or, you know, a hybrid workforce or whatever it might be. You know, there's always been management books on managing people in the office. So, um, yeah. yeah, you and I might write them. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> that's if we get it right um yeah okay so any other trends that i'm missing that you'd like to share that you think would be good for everyone to know about i mean the the, the one thing that we're kind of seeing at the moment is obviously the um the cost of living crisis and impacting consumers and there's a lot of behaviors that are starting off at the moment of kind of how do we cut our cloth to to fit and so you're get, getting a lot of behaviors in terms of uh reducing the length of, of stay to trading down in kind of in terms of accommodation um uh kind of reducing secondary spend at attractions, kind of those type of behaviours, you know, more day breaks than kind of weekend kind of getaways, that type of thing. Uh, very much um, booking at the last minute. Uh, we used to think that people le left it to the last minute. Now they're really leaving it to the last yeah. minute. Basically because they're, they're unsure of what their their finances are going to be. And, and unless you're very sure of your finances, you don't want to commit kind of in three months time to, to, to go on holiday when you don't know kind of what's going to, to happen in the meantime. Yeah. So all of the kind of concerns and um, insecurity that's coming through from kind of rising inflation is having these types of impact, which businesses are having to deal with, you know, it, it's a real, um, almost a game of chicken with, with consumers about, you know, mm. you're two weeks out, and you've got no one coming to stay do you reduce your prices at a time when your costs are going up or do you tough it out and kind of hope to get those last minute bookings mm. um, and so consumers are kind of pushing on the side of you know the longer I hold out there might be a kind of last minute you know discount that I can get and uh, businesses are trying to hold their prices to the last minute um, mm. to kind of maintain their margins so mm. you know, we've got this situation where um, businesses are finding it kind of uh, impossible not to increase their prices just at the time when customers are finding it impossible to pay increased prices. So there is a real tension there and what dynamic there that um, isn't easy to resolve. Mm. Yes, again, lots of lots of things to think about. I can only think that therefore you have to start to become innovative and think yeah. about other markets or other ways of doing business or different uh, pricing strategies, marketing strategies. Um, it's a kind of business review, isn't it, um, that is needed? Yeah, exactly. It, it's mm. kind of okay, kind of the, the way that you kind of sold your product in the past may not be the best way to, to tell it in, in the current environment. Yeah. Um, and what we found, you know, from from COVID, I think it's kind of very true going forward with with inflation. Is people kind of want certainty that kind of uh, that things aren't going to increase in price, that they're going to have no additional costs, that kind of whatever they do will be um, protected. Uh, so if if things do go wrong, they can get their money back um, as well. If they kind of lose a job or you know they yeah. get bills and that they just can't afford um that there will be some flexibility in the system but it, you know, it's a, a very difficult kind of circle to square between kind of businesses and consumers who are both under considerable pressure at the moment mm. this is going to be really fun to interview you in 2030 <laughs> <laughs> I'm still around 2030 <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, find out you know and come do a whole review on how this decade has been yeah um, that would be fun wouldn't it and we can replay this sort of this is how we found it in 2022 and then over to 2030 and this is what's happened but yeah there I you mean, go. The, the real nervousness yeah. that kind of I'm hearing from from businesses mm. is that kind of this year is soft you know it's not great but it's mm you know, not a disaster either. But the real concern is what happens next year? And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people saved up a large amount of money. There was even kind of talk uh, from government um, economists that people had saved around 200 billion pounds uh, during COVID with not going out and, and spending. Now, obviously, that's not evenly distributed across you know, the population, but sure. there was, was actually a kind of a fair wadge of money out there. Mm. Um, the concern is that people have 
burnt through that money now or, or are burning through it because of kind of increased prices. So the question is, what happens next year? And um, even the Office for Budget Responsibility is predicting inflation kind of around 13% uh, next year. And there's even been talk about it even up to 18%. So in that sort of environment, kind of how long are, are people's kind of savings going to last and what are mm. the implications of that for, for businesses, mm. trying to get people to, to go out, take a holiday, even just to socialise after work. Yeah. Um, so that, I think, is is the real concern of kind of what happens next. Next, yes. I think um, throughout all of the different crises we've had, I haven't been in the industry as long as I have been. Um, there's always that concern each time we've got the financial crash or we've had the Gulf Wars and, and I could go on the September the 11th. It seems that increasingly as we've gone on through um, time, people have always found holidays to be an essential factor and save very hard. And, and sometimes even if it is their only holiday, uh, it does put pressure on the industry to make sure that it's a good one. You know, <laughs> make sure everybody's yeah. smiling and really happy. But I do, I do think, no matter how tough things get, that holiday becomes even more precious and needed to relieve stress and anxiety. And you know, it's sort of seen as a as an important boost to health. So yeah, yeah, that, you're absolutely right. You know, the the work that we've done and and other people have done over the years shows that tourism and having a holiday has moved from a luxury to a, a necessity in life. That's the phrase. I couldn't yeah. think what it was. I knew there was a phrase. Yeah, luxury <laughs> yeah. to necessity. And yes. people will will kind of cut their cloth to to fit to to get it in. And yeah. what we saw through the um the financial crisis is that people stopped paying for a new fridge, a new TV, kind of recarpeting the place. And the savings that they made from, from those items, they put into having a holiday. So they oh, kind wow. of still wanted to, to keep go. a holiday mm. and would cut down on other things, other kind of capital expenditure to be able to do that, which is yeah. great. Mm. And the other thing that we found from the global economic crisis, which is a kind of a good news story from the industry, mm. is that when things start picking up, kind of tourism is at the forefront of that. Mm. And there was work done by the ONS, uh, which found out that kind of following the global economic crisis uh, for three years afterwards, a third of all new jobs in the UK um, were created by the tourism industry. So you, you take mm. kind of the pressure off people yeah. and they want to go out and celebrate. They want to take a holiday, take a break somewhere. And so kind of tourism industry has this, this fascinating, fantastic ability to bounce back mm. um, incredibly quickly and yeah. I'm sure that that's going to happen this time we've just got to get through <laughs> this next kind of wave um, kind of inflation when inflation starts to, to fall again yeah. I'm sure that kind of tourism expenditure will pick up yeah. immediately well we've already seen fuel coming down so yeah. who knows what so I think sometimes if you think if you hear things like 18 percent inflation you go <gasps> You have to remember today is today, tomorrow is tomorrow, and take each day as it comes and deal with whatever problems come with you today. And yes, have an eye on the future because you've obviously got to do some planning and think about scenarios and, under and listen to talks like this so you can kind of get a feel for which way the wind is blowing, but try not to be too overwhelmed by it, I think, when you get overwhelmed. Uh, and don't watch the 10 o'clock news lately because it's just full of bad news. Let's <laughs> <laughs> give it now. Uh, just listen to the online travel talks and you'll be right. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Right. So uh, leaving on that um, happy note, uh, Kurt, thank you so much for joining us today and checking in. I hope um, you'll be happy to check in perhaps uh, towards the end of the year or the beginning of next so that we've got a few more pearls on how you then see things um, panning out. It's always good to, to hear from you. And we'll see how your birds are doing as well. <laughs> off, the, okay. off the feather variety. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then, Kurt. Thank you very okay. much. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.